The Cube at IBM Impact 2014 is brought to you by headline sponsor IBM. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Paul Gillen. Welcome back everyone, live in Las Vegas at IBM Impact. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. Joe my co-host Paul Gillen. And our next special guest is Grady Bush, who's a uh, legend in the software development community. I know she went to Santa school in Santa Barbara. My son goes there, he's a freshman, but there's a whole nother conversation. Um, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Um, one of the things we're really exciting about when you know, we get all the IBM guys, get the messaging out, you know, the IBM talk, but the groundbreaking work around um, computer software, where hardware is now exploding in capability, big data is instrumentation of data. Um, it takes us to a conversation around cognitive computing, the future of humanity, society, the societal changes that are happening. There's a huge uh, intersection between computer science and social science, something that's our tagline for SiliconANGLE and something we are passionate about. So I, wanna, I just want to get your take on that. And, and talk about some of the work you're doing at IBM. Um, what is all this, where is all this leading to? Where is this unlimited compute capacity, the mainframe in the cloud, big data instrumentation, indexing human thought, um, Fitbits, wearable computers, um, sensors, internet of things, it's all taking us in a direction. What's your vision? There are three things that I think are inevitable and they're irreversible that have unintended consequences, consequences that you know, we can't, we have to attend to and, and, and they will be in our face eventually. The first of these is the growth of computational power in ways we've only begun to see. The second is the development of systems that never forget with storage beyond even our expectations now. And the third is a pervasive connectivity such that we see the foundations for not just millions of devices, but billions upon billions of devices. Those three trends appear to be where technology is heading. And yet, if you follow those trends out, one has to ask the question as you begin to, what are the implications for us as humans? Um, I think that the net of those is an interesting question, indeed, to put in a personal plug. My wife and I are developing a documentary for the computer history, with the Computer History Museum uh, for public television on that very topic, looking at how computing intersects with the human experience. So we're seeing those changes in every aspect of it. Two that I'll dwell upon here, which I think are germane to this particular conference, are some of the ethical and moral implications, and second, what the implications are for cognitive systems. On the latter case, we saw in the news, I guess it was today or yesterday, there's a foundation led by the Gates Foundation that's been looking at collecting data for kids in various schools, a number of states stood up for it. But as they begin to realize what the implications of aggregating that information were for the privacy of that child, uh, the parents became, you know, became cognizant of the fact that, wow, we're disclosing things for which there can be identification of the kid in ways that maybe we don't want to do that. So I think the explosion of big data and the explosion of computational power has led us as a society to begin asking those questions. What are the limits of ownership and the rights of that kind of information? And that's a dialogue that will continue on. In the cognitive space, it kind of follows on because one of the problems of big data, and it's not just you know big, big data, but like you see in, at CERN and the like, but also these problems of aggregation of data, there are there is such an accumulation of information at such a speed in ways that an individual human cannot begin to reason about it in reasonable ways. Thus was born what we did with Watson a few years ago, Watson Jeopardy. I think the most important thing that the Watson Jeopardy experience led us to realize is that there is an architectural framework upon which we can do many interesting reasoning things. And now that Watson has moved from research into the Watson group, we're seeing that expand out in so many domains. So the journey is really just beginning as we take what we can know to do and reason with automated systems and apply it to these large data systems. It's going to be a conversation we're going to have for a few generations. 
you, you, we're beginning to see, I mean, computing has moved beyond the, the, the role of automator, of, of automating rote manual tasks. We're seeing, uh, it's been, uh, I've seen forecasts that the, the, most of the jobs that will be automated out of existence in the next 20 years will be, will be uh, uh, knowledge jobs. And uh, even one journalism professor forecasting that 80% of journalism jobs will go away and will be replaced by computer uh, over the next couple of decades. Are, is this something for, for people to fear? I'm not certain fear will do us any good, especially if a change like that is inevitable. Fear doesn't help. But I think that what will help is an understanding as to where those kinds of software systems will impact various jobs and how we as individuals should relate to them. We as a society, we as individuals, in many ways are slowly surrendering ourselves to computing technology and what you describe is one particular domain for that. There's been tremendous debate in the economic and business community as to whether or not computing has impacted the jobs market. I'm not an economist, I'm a computer scientist, but I can certainly say from my inside perspective, I see that transformational shift and I see that what we're doing is radically going to change the job market. There was, you know, if you go back to the Victorian age where people were, were looking for a future in which they had more leisure time because we have these devices to give us, you know, free us up for the mundane, we're there. And yet the reality is that we now have so many things that required our time before, it means there's, in a way, not enough work to go around. And that's a very different shift than I think what anyone anticipated back at the beginnings of the industrial age. And we're coming to grips with that. Therefore, I'd, I'd say this, don't fear it, but begin to understand those areas where we as humans provide unique value that the automated systems never will. And then ask ourselves the question, where can we as individuals continue to add that creativity and value? Because there and then, we can view these machines as our companions in that journey. Brady, I want, I want to ask you about um, the role, I mean, the humans is a great message. I mean, that's the, they're driving the car here. But I want to talk about something around the humanization piece you mentioned. Um, there's a lot of conversations in, around computer science as a discipline, which um, the old generation, when I went to computer science school, was it was code, architecture, but now computer science is literally mainstream. There's, there's general interest, hence why we built this cube operation, to share signal from the noise around computer science. So there's also been a discussion around women in tech, tolerance from different opinions and views, freedom of, of, of uh, speech, if you will and censorship, if everything's measured, and politically correctness, is, all this is now kind of being fully transparent. So, so let's take the women in tech issue and also um, kids growing up who have an affinity towards computer science but may not know it. So I want to ask you the question with all that kind of as backdrop, computer science as a discipline, how is it going to evolve in this space? What are some of those things for the future generation, for the, my son who's in sixth grade, my son's a freshman in college, and then in between? Is it just traditional sciences? What are some of the things that you see uh, that's not just so much coding and learning Java or Objective-C? I, I wish you'd ask me some questions about some really deep topics. I mean, gosh, these are, these are, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's about the kids. In, in, in the early days of the telephone, telephones were a very special thing. Not everybody had them. And it was predicted that as the telephone networks grew, we were going to need to have many, many more telephone operators what happened is that we all became operators. So the very nature of telephony changed so that now I as an individual have the power to reach out and do the connection that had to be done by a human. A similar phenomenon I think is happening in computing, that it has moved itself into the interstitial spaces of our world such that it's no longer a special thing out there. We used to speak of the programming priesthood in the 60s where I just lost my thing here, hang on. There we go, I think we're good. <laughs> we're good. I'm a software guy, I don't do hardware. <laughs> so, my body rejects hardware. Um, so, we're moving in a place where computing very much is, is part of the interstitial spaces of our world. This has led to where I think, you know, the generation after us, because our, our median age is, let me check, it's probably above 20, just, just, <laughs> just yeah. guessing yeah, here. Two years older than me. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm still that, seven, I think. You're still seven. Uh, we're moving to a stage where the notion of computational thinking 
becomes an important skill that everyone must have. My wife loves to take pictures uh, of people along the beach, beautiful sunset, whales jumping, and the family sitting there, and it did it again. My body's rejecting this device. Clearly, I have the wrong shape ears. Oh, you got it, yeah. There we go. Uh, taking pictures of families who are seeing all these things, and they're, they're buried with their heads and their iPhones and their tablets, and they're so wedded to that technology. We often see you know, kids going by in, in strollers, and they've got an iPad in front of them looking at something. So we have a generation that's growing up uh, knowing how to swipe and knowing how to use these devices. It's part of their very world. It's, it's difficult for me to relate to that because I didn't grow up in that kind of environment, but that's the environment after us. So the question I think you're generally asking is, what does one need to know to live in that kind of world? And I think it's those notions of computational thinking. It's an idea that's come out of uh, the folks at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, which asks the question, what are some of the basic skills we need to know? Well, you need to know some things about what an algorithm is and a little bit behind, you know, behind the screen itself. One of the things we're trying to do with the documentary is opening the curtain behind just the windows, you say, and, and ask the question, how do these things actually work? Because some degree of understanding to that will be essential for you know, anyone moving into, into, into life. Um, you talked about women in tech in particular. Uh, it is an important question, and I think that uh, I've worked with many women side by side in the things that I do, and you know, frankly, it saddens me to see the way our educational system, in a way back to middle school, produces a bias that pushes young women out of this society. So I'm not certain that it's a bias that's built into computing, but it's a bias built into culture, it's bias built into our educational system, and that obviously has to change because computing you know, knows no gender or religious or sexual orientation boundaries. It's just part of our society now. I do want and to everyone ask you, needs to contribute. I'm sorry, yes. I do want to ask you about software development since you're, you're, oh, yes. you're devoted your career to- I know a couple to, of things about it. <laughs> to defining uh, uh, architectures and disciplines of software development. We're seeing software development now as epitomized by Facebook perhaps, moving to much more of a fail fast uh, mentality. Uh, try it, put it out there, if it breaks it's okay, no lives were lost, uh, pull it back in and we'll try it again. Is this, is there a risk in, in this new approach uh, to software? Well, so many things there. First, is it a new approach? No, it's part of the agile process that we've been talking about for well over a decade, if not 15 years or so. You must remember that it's dangerous to generalize upon a particular development paradigm that's applied in one space that apply to all others. With Facebook, in general, nobody, no one's life depends upon it. And so there are things that one can do that are simplifying assumptions. If I apply that same technique to a dialysis machine, to the avionics of a 777, uh, simply doesn't work. apply, yeah. no. So one must be careful to generalize those kind of approaches to every place. It depends upon the domain, depends upon the development culture, ultimately depends upon the risk profile that would lead you to high ceremony or low ceremony approaches. Do you have greater confidence in the software that you see being developed for mission critical applications today than you did 10 years ago? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, I'll tell you a quick story, and I know we need to wind down. I had elective open heart surgery a few years ago. Elective because every male in my family died of an aneurysm, an aortic aneurysm. So I went in, got checked, and indeed I had an aneurysm developing as well. So we had it, you know, had my heart ripped open and, and dealt with before uh, it would burst on me. I remember laying there in the in the uh, in the CT scan machine, looking up and saying, "Hmm, this looks familiar." Oh my God, I know the people that wrote the software for this thing, and they used the UML. <laughs> and I realized, oh, this is a good thing. Which is your creation. <laughs> because, yes, yes. So it's a good thing because I felt confidence in the software that was there because I knew it was intentionally engineered. Great, I want to ask you some society questions around sure. IT and computing. Obviously green is key, and data centers take up a lot of space, right? So obviously we want to get to a smarter uh, data center environment. And how do you see the role of software, obviously with the cognitive and all the things you talked about, helping businesses build a physical plant, if you will, and is it a shared plan, is openness? Sure. You're seeing open power systems here from IBM, you're hearing obviously open source, open source. Um, what, what does that future look like from your standpoint? May I borrow that cup of tea or coffee? I want to use it as a visual aid. Let's presume, oh it's still warm. Uh, let's say that this is some tea. 
and roughly the energy cost to boil water for a cup of tea is roughly equivalent to the energy cost needed to do a single Google search. Now imagine if I multiply that by a few billion times and you can begin to see the energy costs of some of the infrastructure which for many are largely invisible. Some studies suggest that computing has grown to the place where at least in the United States it's consuming about 10% of our electrical energy production. So by no means is it something we can sweep under the rug. Um, you address, I think, a fundamental question, which is the hidden costs of computing, which people, people are becoming aware of. But then you ask the question also, where can cognitive systems help us in that regard? Um, we live in, in Maui, and there's an interesting phenomenon coming on where there are so many people using solar power, putting it into the power grid, that the electrical grid companies are losing money because we're generating so much power there. And yet you realize if you begin to instrument the way that people are actually using power down to the level of the homes themselves, then power generation companies can start making much more intelligent decisions about day-to-day, -day, almost minute-to-minute -minute power production. And that's something that black box analytics would help, but also cognitive systems, which are not really black box analytic systems, they're more learned systems, learning systems, can then predict what that might mean for the energy production company. So we're seeing, even in those places, the potential of using cognitive systems for, for uh, attending to energy costs in that regard. The future is a lot of possibilities. I know you got to go. We're getting the hook here big time because okay. you got to We really appreciate it. These are important future decisions that are, we're on track to, to help solve. And I really appreciate it. Looking forward to the documentary. Any timetable on that? Uh, Sometime before I die. <laughs> <laughs> Grady, thanks for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate it. This is uh, SiliconANGLE's theCUBE. Uh, we'll be right back with our next guest after thanks this short break.